Oh, you like melodic death metal? Say the name of every song in the second Unleashed album backwards in alphabetical order. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and let me start by asking you a question. You know how sometimes you're listening to Spotify and a song comes on and you think it's by your favorite band and you're like, wait a minute, I don't know this song. How is that possible? I know all their songs. And then you look and you realize that it's not your favorite band. It's just some other band that did a very, very good job of ripping them off. And you're like, okay, I get it. I like Meshuggah too, but come on, guys. You can't just straight up copy their homework. You gotta change the answers at least a little bit. Meshuggah is one of the most obvious examples, but they're far from the only one. So today we are going to talk about the most ripped off bands from pop punk to metal to gent to hardcore and everything in between. But before I get into it, I wanted to mention I started a weekly newsletter. There's no spam or ads or anything like that. Just every week I'm going to send out an email that has a link to any videos or podcasts I put out this week, links to whatever I'm watching or reading or listening to this week. Again, no spam. I'll never sell your address or anything like that. It's just updates on my content. So if you want to sign up to that, there's a link in the description. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. You stole my meme. So first of all, let's talk about the difference between being influenced by somebody and just ripping them off, because I do think it matters. Being influenced by other people is great. It's a huge part of being a creator of any kind. You take a little bit of this person's style, a little bit of that person's style, add some of your own special unique sauce, and now you get something new and great. For example, Periphery is obviously very influenced by Meshuggah, but they added their own thing, the rock vocals and some of the like more atmospheric parts and came up with their own sound that's very different than Meshuggah. On the other hand, when you're just trying to like be another artist, like musically cosplaying as them or sometimes visually cosplaying as them too, that's what I would call ripping off. Like imagine if you're asking Alexandria and you see this video. Come on guys, really? You couldn't even just change it a little bit? So with that in mind, let's talk about the first band, The Ramones. I loved this band when I was in seventh or eighth grade and I guess that I wasn't the only one because there's an entire genre dedicated to emulating this band. Bands like The Queers, Screeching Weasel, Sloppy Seconds, Teenage Bottle Rocket. And although, generally speaking, I find this level of plagiarism to be kind of lame, in this case, I can actually kind of respect it because of just how blatant it is. Screeching Weasel had an album called Ramones where they covered a bunch of Ramones songs, which is pretty funny, but the queers took it to a whole other level. They covered an entire Ramones album from start to finish. They didn't change the style or add anything new. They just covered it note for note as closely as possible. And you know what? I kind of love it. I mean, if you're gonna rip off a band, you might as well just be completely shameless about it, right? And we really couldn't do this video without mentioning Meshuga because holy shit, there is probably no single band in which there's a bigger disparity between their commercial success and how much they've been emulated. They may not have sold a ton of records, but they have been absolutely shamelessly copied by literally thousands of bands. If you're watching this, you're probably very familiar with Meshuggah, but for anybody who isn't, any band that plays cool, genty riffs like this is without a doubt taking a page out of the Meshuggah playbook, whether they know it or not, in the same way as any band that plays a riff like this. is taking a page out of the Slayer playbook, which is totally fine. Like I said, we all have our influences, but where it gets a little bit awkward is when people tell me about some brilliant, innovative new band that's doing the coolest shit. And so I check it out. But then when I press play, it's this. Which if you're familiar with Meshuggah, you will realize is a little bit too close to their most famous song, Bleed. And look, I get it. Meshuggah is one of those bands where their riffs are so fucking cool that of course you want to steal them. How could you not? Because let's be honest, you're never going to come up with a better Meshuggah riff than Meshuggah did. But resist the urge, because that's stealing. And remember, you wouldn't download a riff, would you? And next up, the interesting case of no effects and bad religion. And the reason why I'm combining those two bands is because of the transitive property. If you remember that from like algebra class in junior high school or whatever, like if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. That's kind of what happened back in the 90s with no effects and bad religion. If you go back and listen to the catalog of labels like Fat Records, which was like the definitive skate punk label of the 90s, you'll quickly realize that pretty much the entire genre is composed of bands doing their very, very best to sound exactly like no effects. For example, or 
And of course, it wasn't just the sound, it also came with the look. The Dickies shorts, Airwalks, Guy Fieri hair, and Black Flies sunglasses that you still see on like a surprisingly large amount of punk dads in Huntington Beach. But here's where the transitive property comes in. The wrinkle here is that no effects themselves were largely emulating Bad Religion, specifically the Bad Religion album Suffer. And I'm not making this up, Fat Mike himself said this in lots of interviews. And so we have a question, were those bands copying no effects or were they copying Bad Religion or were they copying no effects copying Bad Religion? I will let the pop punk academics debate that question, but what I would like to see is Bad Religion turn the tables on no effects by putting out an album of no effects style skate punk. Put away the thesaurus, put away the PhDs, just go back to the basics. Change your name to like Fat Greg, call the next album My Dick Hurts, and the cover art is a drawing of a guy punching himself in the balls. All right, next up, Architects. I've complained about this before, and you know what? I'm gonna keep complaining about it. You can call me a boomer too if you want but I'm not gonna let this one go. And what I'm talking about is this riff from Doomsday by Architects. Does it sound familiar to you? Have you maybe heard it somewhere else? Maybe here? Or here? Or in like 500 other metalcore songs that are just like blatant ripoffs of Architects. Guys, can we just officially move on from copying this riff? I get it. Architects are cool and that deedly 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 riff is awesome, but enough is enough. Drop the seven string, put your hands above your head, scumbag. You're under arrest. But you know what? I'm feeling generous today, so consider this a warning. Next time I might not be so nice. So if we catch you stealing that doomsday riff again, I'm gonna have no choice but to haul your ass into the station and call your parents. And next up, title fight. If you've ever heard bands that sound like this, or this, included under the category of pop punk, and thought to yourself, that's kind of weird, how was this pop punk? Today, I have the answer for you, and that is Tidal Fight. When they came out back in 2009, they sounded like this. They were actually very early to the sad boy pop punk sound, which added kind of a little bit of an emo, post-hardcore, indie kind of tinge to the classic pop punk thing. And over the next few years, that sound became very, very popular. But by the time all the other bands had caught up with them and started doing something along the same lines, they had moved on to doing this. Which has a lot more in common with 90s shoegaze or indie rock than it does pop punk. It's not my thing, but I can appreciate that it was like new and different and innovative and it definitely turned a lot of heads. In fact, it turned like the entire pop punk scene's head because as soon as that album came out, half the pop punk scene was like, initiate shoegaze transition. And the next thing you know, by 2012 or so, the pop punk scene was full of shoegaze bands. And like a lot of innovative ahead of the curve bands, Title Fight broke up, but I think they need to come back and shake things up again because pop punk's been kind of dormant for a while. So Title Fight, here's what I think you need to do. Reunite, but instead of doing the indie shoegaze thing again, put out an album of like 2009 style pizza easy core. And along the same lines as No Effects and Bad Religion, At The Gates. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, but first, for those who aren't aware, At The Gates is the band that really kicked off the melodic death metal fad of the late 90s and early 2000s. Go! No, they were not the first, and I would say they probably weren't even the most popular of the melodic death metal bands, but I think they were the first ones that got critical mass and made everybody kind of go, oh, yeah, let's do that from now on, in the same way as Suffocation and Cannibal Corpse did in the early 90s, when the death metal scene was full of what they called suffo clones. And they also inspired that initial wave of early 2000s metalcore like Kill Switch Engage, and especially As They Lay Dying, which I would say is pretty much just at the gates with breakdowns. And then in turn, As I Lay Dying inspired five bajillion other metalcore bands that used that same formula of like mellow death riffs with breakdowns. And I'm sure there were some of those later bands that did actually listen to At The Gates, but I'm pretty sure that most of them didn't and probably actually didn't even know who At The Gates were, which to be clear is totally fine. I'm not upset about that. And I think that bands have absolutely zero obligation to know their influences or whatever. Oh, you like melodic death metal? Say the name of every song in the second Unleashed album backwards in alphabetical order. But that said, it was kind of interesting to see because the net result of all that was that like by 2009 or so, there were goofy high school kids in Dayton starting Christian metalcore bands playing at the gates riffs, thinking that they were playing as they lay dying riffs. Just kind of interesting to me to see how culture can trickle down that way. 
And next, Black Sabbath. My introduction to doom metal was back in, I think maybe 1992 or so, when I heard a band called Cathedral. They were a new band with Lee Dorian from Napalm Death. And I was like, oh, this guy was in Napalm Death? Sick, this is gonna be brutal. So I bought the album, I put it on, pressed play, and it sounded like this. And I was like, what? This is not brutal. This sounds like Black Sabbath. And I think the next Doom kind of band I heard was Trouble. I saw them open for, I think, White Zombie or something around 92, 93. And then I got the Sleep album and that came out. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm starting to see a pattern here. I think this whole Doom thing is just pretty much bands that are trying to be Black Sabbath. And I wasn't wrong. I mean, that's kind of what Doom is. Even down to a lot of the bands dressing like it's 1972 and using that same style of psychedelic art. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I listen to Slam, which is possibly the most formulaic genre of metal of all. I just think it's interesting when there's genres like Doom that are essentially perfected by the first band to do it. And everything after that is kind of a bunch of bands trying to chase the dragon of recreating the magic of that first band, but never really quite getting there because they were just so fucking good at it. I don't really personally listen to a lot of Doom, but I'm totally cool with it. All I ask from the world is please, no more Black Sabbath parody shirts. Although actually what's even worse than that is black flag parody shirts. Do you know how in some countries like it used to be where if you got caught stealing, they would cut off your hand? I think that should be the punishment for putting out a black flag parody shirt. All right, so before I go on, I just kind of wanted to point out an interesting pattern that kind of emerged as I was writing this video about metal. What I noticed is that it's almost always metal bands influencing other genres, not the other way around. For example, like hardcore bands bringing in thrash metal influences created crossover and metalcore. Or pop punk bands bringing in like metal or metalcore influences created easycore. Or all the deathcore bands like Carnifex that started to bring in like black metal elements. And of course, all the many, many ways that metal aesthetics have been borrowed over the years. Everybody from fashion brands to beverage companies has used like metal style logos and artwork. Pop artists like Justin Bieber and Lady Gaga have done like a metal aesthetic. Lots and lots of people borrow from metal, but you never really see the opposite. For example, like you never see metal bands borrow from pop punk. And why is that? Well, one possibility is that metal is just so brilliant and innovative and ahead of the curve that everybody else in the world just steals their ideas because they're so great, which is probably true to some extent, but I don't think that's all there is to it. What I think is a lot more likely is that metal culture has a big case of not invented here syndrome. Basically that metal culture is very insular and metal bands and fans are pretty much not interested in anything that's happening outside their little metal bubble. Which is too bad because I think we could see some really cool things happen, but unless metal stops being such an uptight traditionalist culture, we probably never will. And speaking of metal influences, Bones, the rapper. You didn't think I could go a whole video without mentioning emo rap, did you? In case you're not familiar, he was one of the OGs of the alternative rap scene, who I would say is responsible for creating a huge part of that genre's musical and aesthetic conventions. For example, if you're wondering how it came to be that every alternative rapper, as a friend of mine put it, looks like a member of Metallica from 1992, and all their music videos look like lost footage from your weird uncle's drawer of old VHS tapes? The answer is Bones. You kind of don't hear his name come up that often these days, or at least I don't, but he was among the very first to put screams in rap. He was sampling Burzum way back in 2014, six years ago when that was like totally unheard of in rap. And this video is still kind of the template for like your basic alternative rap video. Some greasy kid who looks like he's been up for three days wearing an old metal shirt acting weird in a backyard with a VHS filter over it. The template for every Astari rapper. But what I'm not sure of is how many of these newer alternative rap or emo rap kids are directly looking to Bones as an influence. Like I said, I don't actually hear people mention him very often and six years is an eternity in that scene. But I don't know, I could be wrong. Let me know in the comments. And next we have Agnostic Front and Madball. Oh boy, where do I start with this one? As you may or may not be aware, there's a whole genre that we used to call tough guy hardcore, which more or less boils down to all the bands cosplaying as Agnostic Front or their sister band Madball. 
who were the definitive New York hardcore bands of the 80s and 90s, respectively, and both great bands. But when it comes to their copycats and cosplayers, ugh. very few things make me feel more vicariously embarrassed than going on the Hardcore Worldwide channel and seeing some band from Belgium called like Point of Force or Life Stunts doing their very best to impersonate Madball's Down by Law video. Like I'm imagining they have every frame of the video printed out and pinned up on the walls like the command center in some cop movie. And they're studying every frame, looking for new ideas. Matthias, I found something. Look at his arm movements at this moment. We must practice this motion immediately. Quickly, fetch me my 25 to life basketball jersey. And next up, Seosin, who as far as I'm concerned are the template for the whole post hardcore scene. I made a whole video about this, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but any band that has those like slightly metallic discordant kind of riffs with high pitched singing and screaming, they're probably one of the many, many, many bands who heard the translating the name EP back in the day and said, yeah, let's do that. Now, who do we know that can impersonate Anthony Green? And just in case you think I'm making this up, compare this to this. No, that's not a cover. Those are supposedly two different songs. Naughty Naughty. What's really strange about this one to me is like, did you think nobody would notice? It's not like Seosin is some obscure local band. I mean, they sold hundreds of thousands of albums and I would say pretty much anybody that listens to Sleeping With Sirens knows of Seosin. So I'm just kind of surprised that there was nobody at like band practice that was like, uh, dude, we can't steal a Seosin riff. What are you doing? And I'm not trying to be snarky here. Like I'm genuinely baffled that a band as big as Sleeping With Sirens would do that. And lastly, Dead Guy slash Rorschach. When I tweeted about this, quite a few people mentioned Botch. And there's definitely something there. A lot of bands did emulate Botch, but the true originators of the scronky mathcore thing are Dead Guy. And their guitarist old band Rorschach. The credit for this whole genre really goes to one person, and that is Keith Huckins, the guitarist of both bands. You've probably never heard of this band because they just kind of got lost in the hardcore history books. But back in 1994, when their 7-inch came out, I feel like half the bands that were playing Earth Crisis Moshcore heard that, and then they were like, oh, it sounds pretty cool when you go chud chud, and then wee wee. And one of those bands was Botch. I think I saw their second or third show in Seattle, maybe in like 95 or so, at the height of the Dead Guy fad. But maybe the most significant of all those bands was Dillinger Escape Plan. I mean, listen to this. Total dead guy. And again, I'm not making this up. I actually asked either Ben or Dimitri from Dillinger about this. I can't remember. They're from the same kind of area as Dead Guy, and he said that they were basically trying to out Dead Guy, Dead Guy. And I actually think they pulled it off, especially in calculating Infinity. Dead Guy was a very big influence uh, on us. Dead Guy was the band that really got me into heavy music. So if you were to draw a mathcore family tree, at the very top, it would have Rorschach and Dead Guy with Botch, Dillinger, and Coalesce at the second level. And then after that, the one big pivotal band in the genre, I think, is Norma Jean. They're the ones that brought that sound to something close to the mainstream and inspired the 9 million other bands that did the mathcore thing. So there you go, the history of mathcore in like 30 seconds. All right, my friends, that does it for this video about the most ripped off bands in history. Let me know what you think about this. If you'd like to see a part two, I could totally turn this into a series because there's a lot more bands that I could have mentioned here but didn't. Also, reminder, if you would like a weekly update with every video and podcast and interview and other piece of content I put out, as well as links to what I am reading or watching or listening to, you can sign up for my brand new email list. There's a link to that in the description and I will never sell your email address. I will never send you ads or spam you or anything anything else like that. Also, as always, I want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. It is because of your support that we're able to do the podcast as well as a lot of other things. So I'm sincerely grateful for that. If, if you would like to support us, patrons get every podcast a week early. There's a members only private discord server that I'm in all the time. There's a way to have me review your band or your design or photography portfolio, your YouTube channel. I just reviewed like a tabletop RPG. Anything else that you want to send my way is fair game. So if that sounds cool, you can hit the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.